Well, before we talk about this subject, let me give you a bit of background to it. I'm sure you've seen in the press that in Europe we are very much in unsettling times. And it was felt by the Military Service Committee, which has been in operation now for nearly 100 years, uh, to, to put out a, a request for a day of conscientious objection and awareness in the United Kingdom. You can see the date on the screen. It was held on the, um, September the 19th, 2015. And it was really significant, brothers and sisters. There were over 600 brothers and sisters and young people. And it was the first time that we came together for nearly 100 years of ma on matters of conscientious objection. The last time we came together on that topic was during the First World War. It was a very serious day. And I was privileged to be asked to give the talk on that day. And that's um, what I'm going to share with you today. So that's the history of it. Well, it's possibly then fair to say that until times of war and conflict arise, the subject of conscientious objection and separation probably does not receive a, a priority in our minds. For, for many of us, we were either too young or not even alive when brothers and sisters of an earlier time were conscientious objectors on matters of life and death. But wanting to be a conscientious objector comes from two main Bible principles which are laid out here. The first one is that we are to be separate from the world. We are strangers and pilgrims. Being in Christ means that we are separated to God for his purpose. And number two, for followers of Jesus, something that we've been looking at this week in Philippians, our true citizenship belongs in heaven. And on these two important points, brothers and sisters and young people, we are to be willing and to be prepared to tell others about the reasons why we are conscientious objectors. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 3 verse 15, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Quite a challenging set of words there. Give an answer to every man that asketh you, we read there. The word answer is the Greek word apology. Now, Paul is not telling, or Peter is not telling us here that we are to, to make an apology in our defence of the things that we believe. Because that word there means to be ready to make reasons, to provide reasons for why we, we believe something to be true. It's a defence, brothers and sisters and young people. And I wonder, if we were ever asked, could we give a defence? Are we prepared to give a defence? Do we give a defence? That's our own individual responsibilities, brothers and sisters, to give a defence on those things that we believe. Well, the word conscience is an interesting word. It is the Greek word sonodesis, and it's translated conscience 32 times in the New Testament. And interestingly, it means a knowing of oneself, being one's witness. It comes from the root, which means to see together, hence to comprehend. It speaks of a process, a process that's going on in one's life. And through that process, being attentive, we learn, we understand, and we change. That's what the word means. Now, that's very powerful. Because what we're being told here is that the will of God, the will of God, all these things come from God, the will of God, when it is a, 
absorbed through the meditation of the scriptures, it becomes our conscience. I'll say that again. The will of God that is expressed in God's word by prayerfully reading God's scriptures, it becomes our conscience. And it becomes our conscience because without it, we are incapable, aren't we, of judging right from wrong. We do not have God's divine viewpoint, do we? So we require God's thoughts to be first implanted in our minds. So the knowledge of God's will is the source of the Christadelphian conscience. That's the responsibility that we have in reading God's word. How can we develop a conscience without it? But a conscience is more than obeying the Bible out of ritual. When we look at the context of the word, we see that it's more about a mind. It's a character. It's a way of life. It is centred upon God's word. And if our conscience is based upon our understanding of God's word, then our conscience, as it were, is a living organism that's always in a state of flux. And if we exercise it, then it becomes stronger. And if we fail to use it, it depletes and dies. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? The the conscience, based upon our reading of God's word, is a living organism within us, as it were. And without reading and meditating and prayerfully reflecting, then it dies. In many ways, then, our conscience is the barometer of our faith. Our life as disciples of Christ is continually adjusted by our conscience. The decisions of life become decisions of conscience. Now remember what we said, that there are two main Bible principles for being a conscientious objector. And I want to look at these in turn. The first one is being a stranger and a pilgrim, and the other one being a heavenly citizen. So let's just look at these in turn. Being a stranger and pilgrim. Now you you may feel that that is a frequently used phrase in the New Testament. Well it's not actually. We, We only come across that phrase twice. It's found in Hebrews 11 verse 13 and 1 Peter 2 verse 11, as we have on the screen. And the word strangers is different in both cases. Though pilgrim is the same, the word strangers is different. We're going to read these. You can read them on the screen or you can turn them up in your Bibles. The first one then, Hebrews 11 verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The second one, 1 Peter 2 verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So there we have one in Hebrews and the other one in Peter. Let's just look at these words in turn. And the first one in Hebrews, the word for strangers, is the word xenos, which means foreign, a foreigner, a guest. That's the idea of that phrase. Foreign, a foreigner, a guest. The second word in Peter is parochis, which means dwelling near, foreign. And in both references, the word pilgrims, paradimos, means sojourning in a strange place. So if you put all these terms and expressions together, I would say you have something like this. The phrase strangers and pilgrims describes one who is always absent from his own land, an exile, a stranger, but will one day come to his own place, the land of his inheritance. Now does does that describe you, brothers and sisters and young people? That's the whole idea of being a stranger and a pilgrim. And this is our position, isn't it? We stand apart from society in which we live. We we are separated from the world, and our separation comes from a godly conscience. If God's word is implanted within our minds, then it takes root, and we come into conflict with the world. 
and we will be separate from it. That's the process. God's word in our minds. And that word in our minds brings about a separation. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God. Working within us. Developing an inner conscience. The prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ to his Father regarding the future well-being of his disciples. Look at these words. I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world so our attitude to military service then is not just a a matter of conscience but in fact it's an extension of our way of life it's not based on any humanitarian compassion that we might have for others but it's solely based upon the Bible. And our conscientious objection is not just about military service, but it relates to anything that conflicts with the law of Christ. Citizenship. We've seen that being strangers and pilgrims in this life, and now Paul is going to raise us to heavenly things as we've been considering in our series this week. In Philippians, and look at the words we have here, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. You may remember the word conversation is the Greek politumo, where we get the English word politics. It's a form of government. It is citizenship. It comes from the root to live as a citizen. So being a stranger and pilgrim in this life means that we are citizens in heaven today and we asked some very practical questions about that didn't we this morning whether in reality we are citizens of heaven a colony that rests in heaven so what does this mean then in practice because we have a an earthly citizenship don't we but we we are born and we are raised and we live in particular countries and societies and we are citizens of that country, aren't we? This is not our choice, but it is just law. So then, we have two kinds of citizenship, but one prevails, brothers and sisters. As Christadelphians, as followers of the Lord Jesus, we have a dual citizenship. We have a heavenly and we have an earthly citizenship. But both of these citizenships are governed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them are governed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now with that, can we go to our introduction, our introductory reading in Romans 13. Can we just turn there please? And as you look down the first seven verses, we see that we have to be obedient to government in many matters. And we are obedient to government because it has been ordained by God. So Romans chapter 13 and then verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And then verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves condemnation. So it makes it quite clear here that the government, our government, whatever we may think of our president here, he has been ordained by God, brothers and sisters. He has been ordained by God. And so then he not only deserves, he demands our respect. Now, I've put together a table here that may be helpful. As you look down these first seven verses, you see that there are both earthly and heavenly requirements of our citizenship. And I've tried to summarise them here. But as we um, look down these verses, what I want to do is just highlight a little phrase there, the end of verse 5, for our conscience sake. Notice that. These things are based upon our conscience. And we've already seen the process. Our conscience is developed by reading God's word and meditating. It is this living organism. And we have to look after it. We have to care for it. We have to nurture it, 
brothers and sisters and young people. So with that in mind then, it is based upon a conscience. Let's just see what we find here. If you glance at verses 1 to 2, you see that we are to obey the laws of state, but at the same time we cannot fight to preserve them. Again, if you look at those opening verses there in 1 and 2, we read that we are to respect and obey the powers that be, but we cannot be involved in voting for them in or out of office. And if you go down to verses 6 and 7, we are commanded to pay our taxes to the state, but we cannot give an oath of allegiance. That's very clear there in this section, and it's a useful section, brothers and sisters, because we can see in the ecclesial world today that this is being dealt with incorrectly, isn't it? These are the rules that are set forth based upon our conscience. So we are reading here that being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ has an earthly citizenship. But that earthly citizenship is not regulated by the state, but is regulated by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to remember, brothers and sisters and young people. And we, as disciples... We meet all the obligations that the state places upon us except those that contravene Christ's law, in which cases the demands of our heavenly citizenship takes precedence over those of our earthly citizenship. It's quite simple, really, if we are faithful to these verses. Peter says here in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. And... and Literally, in the Greek, it means we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. It's not open to question. It is clear. So in summary then, our conscience. Our conscience lies within us and it both frames and measures our actions. It's based upon a knowledge of God's word And unless it's used regularly, it will become ineffective. Now what I want to do is to show you, what I feel anyway, based upon this conscience, there are three specific demands made upon our conscience. I want to share these with you now. And we need to observe these in our lives. These are three rules, I believe. So let's look at these now. Conscience demands that we are always subject unto the higher powers. We are always subject to him, almighty God in heaven. But at the same time, we render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. But the context there, we are subject to the higher power. Conscience demands that we are faithful stewards in the truth, serving one another with a fervent heart and missing no opportunity of telling others about our beliefs. That is citizenship, brothers and sisters. And number three, conscience demands that we are faithful stewards in the world that we are diligent in business, that we serve heartily our masters, and we look after those that we may find in our responsibility that serve us. Humbling, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It goes way beyond conscientious objection and military service. This extends and percolates into every aspect of our lives. I want to bring this to life now. I want to show you an active conscience working. And I can't find a finer example than Daniel. Come with me, please, to the book of Daniel. And we're going to see these three rules 
very much alive in this, in this man's life. So when we come to Daniel chapter 1, we're taking our minds back two and a half thousand years, the ancient city of Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar, and it was magnificent, wasn't it? For anyone, it would become or could become intoxicating with its beautiful architecture, its towering structures, its impressive learning, its sophisticated lifestyle. It was so advanced. Temptations abounded everywhere. In many ways, brothers and sisters and young people, it was an environment so similar to ourselves. And if we go to the opening chapter here in Daniel chapter 1, if you look at verse 3, we can see the, the kind of men that Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. We read that he was going to bring of the royal seed the children of Israel. It literally means the youths of Israel. Daniel and his three friends would be part of that group. Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And as I said to the teenagers this morning, perhaps Daniel was in his mid-teens. At most in his late teens. He was a young man with these three friends of his as he went out. So for the younger ones in the audience here, when we think about conscientious objection, think about Daniel. He's a young man. In Daniel chapter 6, which concludes really his life He's 90 years of age, but here he's just a mere teenager. And look at verse 4 here. What kind of people was Nebuchadnezzar looking for? Well, he was looking for the very best, wasn't he? And for the very best, he was going to give the best training that money could afford to make sure that they reached their full potential. But isn't that true, young people? In today's world, to some lesser extent, schools and colleges and universities and, and even employment today talk about having excellent potential, that they can see your potential. They want you to work harder and harder. They're going to give you better grades and qualifications. They want you to see the world, but they want you to give, to commit, to put more hours in, to build up your experience. They want you to broaden your horizons, to widen your perspectives, to get more exposure to the world. And they're encouraging you, and it's endless, in order that you can reach your full potential. It's no different back home in England. And there's nothing wrong going to university. You've heard that I went to university. Or having a good job. That's not the problem. But young people, we need to be mindful of the pressures that will come our way and the temptations if we choose to leave home and go to university. This was the situation of Daniel and his three friends. There, there is nothing wrong with having a good job or being successful in this life. But we need to appreciate that going up the greasy ladder of success will bring stresses and strains, both in ecclesial life and in your married life. And you need to be prepared for those things. And you need to be evaluating your situation at all times. Remembering that your authority is God. Whether young or old, every one of us in this room faces our own Nebuchadnezzar every single day who tells us that one day we can reach our full potential if we commit our lives to him. Isn't that true? It's no different, brothers and sisters. These wonderful rules that are laid out by Paul here in Romans were being lived out by Daniel so many years earlier. And like Daniel, we too are surrounded by godless people. Our teachers, our lecturers, our bosses, our clients. What do they want from us? They all want our talents and our abilities, don't they? In order to reach our full potential, they want our abilities and our talents. And brothers and sisters and young people, anything that we intrinsically have ourselves, they're not our own, are they? They're, they're not our own. They're God's gifts, aren't they? And so we have to ask ourselves a question every single day. How are we using God's gift that God has graciously bestowed upon us for a short period of time. How are we using them for him? 
You could find yourself very gifted and you can serve this world so well. And if you're not careful, you could lose the kingdom. These were all the challenges that Daniel had with these wonderful gifts and talents that he had. Let's go down to verse 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourished them three years, and the end thereof they might stand before the king. He was going to provide this generous scholarship program, all funded by the king himself. Each day these four young men were going to eat of this daily provision of the king's meat and wine there in verse 5. And can you imagine for just a a fleeting moment what it would be like to literally eat the king's meat and drink his wine? In fact, I think the New King James Version um, renders that phrase there of the king's meat, the king's delicacy. It conveys a, a lovely picture, doesn't it, of the kind of food that was sitting on that plate that Daniel and his three friends were going to refuse. Well, I believe when Daniel, under inspiration, wrote these words, he knew what the real daily provision was. This was going to be a daily provision. This was the temptation. A daily provision. If you've got a margin, the revised version certainly says, a daily portion. And as you can see on the screen, if you uh, just scroll your eyes down this chapter, you can see that that daily provision becomes the portion of the king's meat. I'd like you just to notice that. It's picked out in verse 8, verse 13, verse 15, and verse 16. It is used repeatedly through this chapter that this daily provision becomes the portion of the king's meat. It is a daily portion. I'd like us to notice that, brothers and sisters, because this is loaded with meaning. The king was going to offer this daily portion, his meat and wine, yet for Daniel and his three friends, soon as they heard that this was going to be the daily portion, I don't think there was any temptation. This was never going to be the daily provision, the daily portion for these four young men. Can you have a look at Exodus, please? Exodus chapter 16. And we're just bringing bringing out certain principles. These are principles, brothers and sisters. This is what this talk is all about. Bible principles. Exodus chapter 16 then. And you know the history of this. This is the children of Israel as they made their way out of Egypt. Shall we pick up in verse 2? And the whole congregation, the children of Israel, may murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Can you believe that? What a disgraceful thing to say. When we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So God here is providing them with manna, and we see there that it was going to be provided every day. And there's a phrase here, it's a very telling phrase I'd like you to note, a certain rate. Can you look at that, please? A certain rate, halfway down verse 4. The revised version, and you should see something very similar in your margin, it has a day's portion. So there was Nebuchadnezzar, and he was providing for the four men from Israel, from Jerusalem, a daily portion. Yet these four men knew what their daily portion was. It was this manna. It wasn't going to be Nebuchadnezzar's meat and drink. But he goes on a little more, because if you look um, more carefully at verse 4, you see that phrase, gather a certain rate every day. And that word certain rate is one Hebrew word, debar. And it's used over 800 times in the Old Testament. And in over 800 times, it's used as word. The word. So hidden in the meaning, almost like the manner, hidden in the meaning of this expression, they are being encouraged. As they go out and gather the manner, they were also, as it were, 
in symbol going out and gathering God's Word. And God's Word then is the daily portion. It's not just a Christadelphian term when we talk about the daily portion. What's the portion for the day? It comes from Exodus chapter 16. Now, to confirm this, come over to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and it's made very clear here what this lesson was as Moses recites the history to the children of Israel before he departs. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, then in verse 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. It had nothing to do with bread, we're being told here. It had to do with God's word. As they went out in the manner, and they gathered it from themselves, this was the daily portion. This was God's word. So Daniel and his three friends had to keep their minds on the daily portion for their minds, not the daily portions for their belly. And so we may understand then, you are what you eat. He knew, Daniel knew, that if he ate the king's meat, he would become just like the king. But if he ate God's daily portion, then he would become just like God. They're consistent Bible principles, aren't they? These are stories we know so well. Consistent Bible principles. And so where did we begin? We began about a conscience. And a conscience is based upon reading God's Word, the daily portions, brothers and sisters. And if we do not read, and we do not read daily, gathering a portion for ourselves each day, then we will not have a discerning conscience. And brothers and sisters, that's an exhortation from me and my household as much as it is for us collectively today. It is critical that we open up God's Word each day. And those within our home, we gather together, whether we're on our own, or whether we're blessed with a family, whatever stage in life we are, we are to open up God's Word. Without opening up God's Word and reading it and reflecting upon it, we lose our conscience, brothers and sisters. Now, the final step of Nebuchadnezzar's brilliant devised brainwashing program was to remove their names. And we know this. We don't need to dwell upon this, do we? He wanted to uh, erase their identities. Let's just come back to Daniel chapter 1. Just have a look at the chapter, really. He wanted to erase their identities. This was all about a re-education, wasn't it? We can see there. But in the removing on the names, this was something that could be easily done. And and the same is true for us. We have names in heaven, don't we? They are heavenly ascribed names that we hold today. And with the subtle influences of the world, we can lose them. And this was what was taking place here in Daniel chapter 1. Surreptitiously, this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar's intentions were, to strip them of their names, to remove their identity, to create a block between them and the God of Israel, Yahweh. Doesn't that describe our lives? Certainly in the workplace today. Also at home. And the names that Nebuchadnezzar gave these four young men, as we see on the screen, were the names of his gods, whom he worshipped. Fitting in. Compromising. Following the sheep. (coughs) Accepting the status quo. We know the expressions. This is what it's talking about here. And in all of this, brothers and sisters and young people, Daniel doesn't say a word, does he? He's silent. And we know he's a remarkable man of faith, but he doesn't say a word, does he? He accepts the change in the name. He doesn't stand up. He's waiting. 
He's waiting, brothers and sisters. Have a look at verse 8. Once the names were changed, it didn't matter to this man. He was going to protest about something else. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That's the key phrase there. But Daniel purposed in his heart. This is the first time we read of Daniel making a stand. Now, it's a strange thing, isn't it? As you read these verses together, you might think, well, that's a rather strange stand to make. You're going to have your name changed. Yahweh is being stripped away from you in your identity. Yet this lovely food, sitting on this golden platter, you stand up against that? Don't you think you're overreacting, Daniel? It's only food? Well, the word purpose there in verse 8 is repeated. Come back to verse 7, and here we read how the names were given. Unto whom, we read, the prince of the eunuchs gave name. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar. And that word gave is the same word as purposed. So the Spirit is telling us here that there is a relationship going on between verses 7 and 8. And it's telling us that once the names were given to Daniel and his three friends, Daniel decided that he would not stand up against the names because as far as he was concerned, the names meant nothing. And names don't mean anything really. It's all about action. And once the names were given, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself by eating the king's meat, brothers and sisters. And I think that's a very, very important lesson. Before the king's meat was offered him, Daniel had made the decision. Some translations have, he resolved within his heart. So as soon as the names were given, Daniel resolved within his heart, before the temptation came, that he wouldn't eat of the king's meat. Now, brothers and sisters and young people, this is relevant to all of us. Sometimes temptations take us by surprise, but I think the vast majority, we know they're coming. It may be a meeting that we've got on Wednesday and we have a, a certain discussion and we know that we've got to make a stand. Much of our lives we can anticipate. And it's no good, is it, thinking that God's going to be with us in the live moment and we think that certain words are just going to come into our head and we're going to be able to answer the challenge. No. We've got to be preparing now. We resolve within our hearts that we will not defile ourselves tomorrow. Can you see that? It's really powerful. It's really powerful, isn't it? Daniel was determined that he wouldn't partake of the king's meat before the plate even was extended to him. He'd made up his mind. He was going to make a stand. He'd drawn a line in the sand. How often, brothers and sisters and young people, if you just reflect in recent history, have you done that in reality? Or have you felt, well, I'll try and make a stand. Pray for me. How many times have we gone into that situation, a life situation, we've already made the decision, and we know all the answers, and we're not going to be moved, and we're steadfast. That was Daniel probably 14, 15 years of age. He wasn't even tempted. He looked at that king's delicacies and he thought, it doesn't mean anything to me. I know what the daily portion is. Can you see that? It's really important. Conscientious objection. Making decisions beforehand. Before the battle is fought, we've won it. Now, of course, we will have all kinds of temptations, such as a, a human nature that is prone to sin. But well, that's helpful, isn't it, brothers and sisters and young people? Making decisions beforehand. Being resolved that we're going to be unmovable. Of course. So, if only we had more guts in reality 
to stand up and be counted and to draw a line in the sand. Ask yourselves the question, where's your line? How far are you prepared to be pushed? Or have you even drawn the line in the sand? I don't know. Have I? If you haven't, let's make sure that we've done it soon. And we know, don't we, at the end of this chapter, that Daniel had nothing to fear. He was at least ten times brighter and more intelligent and more insightful than the astronomers and astrologers and the magicians of Nebuchadnezzar's court. There was nothing to fear. And that's the point, isn't it, brothers and sisters? If God be for us, who can be against us? So that's the lesson there in Daniel chapter 1. So let's just think about a few things that we've seen in Paul. So Daniel then and his three friends as young men, they conscience was demanded that they were subject unto the higher power. They resolved within their minds, didn't they? They respected the king, yes, but they regarded the king's meat as the final straw. Daniel was going to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. Can you see that, how those those rules are being acted out here in the life of Daniel? Well, let's just turn over a few chapters to Daniel chapter 3. In fact, we could use this exercise from chapter 1 all the way through to chapter 6. I won't do that. We'll finish here in Daniel chapter 3. I was going to show you a Daniel chapter 6. But let's just look at Daniel chapter 3. So turning to Daniel chapter 3, maybe the king had seen his own face on the image of this dream. And he is going to make this head of gold. He was, of this head of gold, he was going to make an image of gold. He was going to live forever. And we know what this chapter is all about. You've got to fall down and worship this image that I have built in my image and in my honour. And in this creation, Nebuchadnezzar believed that he owned his own personal destiny. Well, as we look down chapter 3, we can see here that that phrase fall down is repeated in verse 5, 10, and 15. And it's not bow down, is it? Sometimes we talk about bowing down to the image, don't we? It's more than that, isn't it? It is to fall down. It's the idea here of rendering yourself absolutely powerless. You fall into a heap. You have given your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. You've given everything to this image. And all that's left is a heap. It's not a a curtsy or a bow to Queen Queen Elizabeth. You are in a heap. You've given everything. That's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. You've fallen down when he plays the music. So where do you draw the line? Daniel's three friends now are under the spotlight and they had very comfortable lives. Should they throw everything away just for a bow? On the one side, they had their lives, of course, but they also had their jobs, their careers, their promotions, their perks, their houses, their comfort and ease, everything that Babylon gave them. And on the other side, they had nothing But God, what do you do when you have everything on one side and just God on the other? What decision do you make? Now let's try to imagine the immense crowd, the excitement and the air of expectancy and the orchestra plays and the multitude drops to the ground and there are just three people left standing. And Nebuchadnezzar's incensed, isn't he? And he gives them now another opportunity to fall down, but they decline his offer. Can we have a look at verses 16 to 18 here? We, we know this account well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But... But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What a lovely phrase that is. God is able to deliver us. We must remember that, brothers and sisters. God is able to deliver us. But 
we read there in verse 18, if it wasn't the will of God, then their minds would still not change. They would not bow down. And brothers and sisters here, isn't life just like that? God can deliver us from every situation. Often he does, but he may choose not to. We don't know what's in store for us. We don't know what depths of our characters will be tested, do we? And I ask you, as we reflect upon Daniel chapter 3, when were these three men delivered? They're not delivered, are they, from the fiery furnace. They're delivered in the fiery furnace. God did not spare them, did he? He wanted to show them that even in the most acute situation of their lives, when their very lives were in doubt, when they could have perished at a moment, God was there. And on this particular day, he chooses to deliver them. Hananiah, Meshach, Hananiah, Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego here recorded in verse 16. At this time, they were high officials in Nebuchadnezzar's court, and we see that they showed themselves to be subject unto higher powers. They honored the king. However, they would not fall to the golden image. But there's something else here, isn't there? If you go down to verse 17, the three friends told Nebuchadnezzar about their God whom they served. And we started there, didn't we? We see how that they were prepared to give an answer of the hope that was within them. We see them as faithful stewards of the truth, not missing the opportunity of telling others about their God and their beliefs. And if we had time, I could show you Daniel chapter 6. And how Daniel now had risen to the second in the court of Persia. And he had that responsible job in this new kingdom. And he, with the demands of his conscience, he was a faithful steward at work. Remember that? At work. That was the third one, at work. But bringing all these things now back to conscientious objection, our world is becoming more opposed to God's word and our beliefs. There is a growing intolerance isn't there? In a world that has no absolute value in God and makes everything relative in this postmodern society, we may find and feel that we are in an absolute impossible situation. When we are commanded to conform, to eat the king's meat, to fall down to the golden image when the music plays, to deny our God and just serve king and country like everyone else, what are we going to do? But let us also not think that being separate and being a conscientious objector is about being prepared for one big stand. A big stand in the future when we're being called up for war. Have a look at Daniel chapter 6. I made a quick mention of it. Have a look there. When Daniel had risen to the second in the court of Persia, what was the efforts of the the hundred or so princes here that wanted to bring this man down? The 120 princes, what were they trying to find? Well, you can see there at the end of verse 4, they were trying to find error and fault in this man. They were looking at error and fault in his everyday life. Daniel was making a stand in his everyday life. And if the state were scrutinising our lives, would our employers, our colleagues, our neighbours and family be able to say that they found no fault or error with us? What would they really say about us? So conscientious objection and all the things that we've looked at here, it's not about preparing ourselves from some day in the future like conscription as Gordon talked about in his opening remarks. But it's about our lives today. It's about being faithful stewards in the truth and in the world, brothers and sisters. It's all about consistency, isn't it? We need to practice what we preach. We need to always be prepared to give an answer of the hope that is within us, the hope of Israel. We need to be standing up for God every day of our lives. The opposition to the Bible in these days is like A roaring lion, isn't it? We are all, as it were, Daniel in the lion's den, 
Every day we can feel the lion's hot breath upon us, the deafening roar for us to shut up, to conform, to imitate, to follow, to obey, to adopt. The battle we face and we continue to face is a huge one. But just as an angel stood with Daniel in the fire, and just, or Daniel's three friends in the fire, and just as an angel spent an evening with Daniel down in the pit in Daniel chapter 6, so we are not alone, brothers and sisters. That's the message here in the book of Daniel. And so then I leave with you just this phrase, in all that we've seen this afternoon, let us continue standing up for God. Thank you.